our mission as a church is simple. We want to lead people to follow Christ in a life-changing way. And we know um, that we can't change lives. There's nothing that, that I could say up here um, that could possibly change your life. It's only by pointing you to relationship with Jesus that will change your life. And so um, if you've ever been to our Antioch 101 class, one of the things that we do is we talk about our culture. Uh, what do we want to be the beliefs and the behaviors of the people um, who claim to be part of this family called Antioch Georgetown? And we talk about five things, and one of those is life change. And we talk about life change, um, we, uh, we, we use a phrase, a statement that says, when you're not actively growing, you are naturally drifting. Say this with me. When you're not actively what? Growing. growing you're naturally what? Drifting. drifting. Listen, growth is active. All right? you, you must participate. There's a work that needs to be done. Um, uh, the drift, that, that just happens naturally. Uh, you don't have to do anything. Guess what? You'll drift. And when Stephen um, does the Antioch 101, he talks about in his family, when they're at the beach, the natural drift that happens when the current kind of pulls you um, off to the side. The illustration I like to use is um, your vehicle, right? We all can relate to a vehicle. How many, raise your hand nice and high if you have a clean vehicle. Right on the inside, um, it's free of dirt. All right, you keep it clean. If someone said, hey, would you give me a ride this afternoon? You would have no trouble whatsoever, right? It smells good. There's not a speck of dust. You are constantly at work to keep your car clean. If you didn't raise your hand on that one, you have to raise your hand on this one, all right? How many of you have a dirty car? It's filthy. It's nasty. If someone said, hey, can I have a ride? You'd say, uh, sure. But first, you know, you start moving stuff out of the seats. Um, you would start explaining smells and, and things like that. Um, if you have kids, you'd blame the kids. I know the kids were in here, you know, and uh, they've got the, that's why the French fries are, are here um, and all those different things. But you kind of know there's this principle that's at play in your car. If you're not actively growing or taking care of it, it will naturally drift towards chaos. If you're good, say I'm good. That same principle that's true for your car is true for your kitchen. Right? If you're not actively taking care of the dishes, what happens? It naturally drifts towards chaos. You come home, you're like, wow, there's this big pile of dishes. Why? It's not the dishes' fault. Right? It naturally drifts. What's true of your car is true of your kitchen, is true of your closet. If you're not actively taking care of your closet and organizing and folding and keeping everything like right where it goes, your closet will naturally drift towards chaos. Listen, what's true of your car is true of your kitchen, it's true of your closet, it is true of your life. It is true of your life. If you are not actively growing in a daily uh, uh, communal relationship with the Lord through His Son, Jesus Christ, and by His Spirit. Listen, you're not coasting. You're not on cruise control. There is a natural drift that begins to take place in our lives. So I want to tell you something today in case you've forgotten. God wants to do a work in your life. He wants to do a work in your life. And this series is about the three areas that God does a work in our life. We're kicking it off today. It'll be for three weeks. He wants to do a work in our head, in our heart, and in our hands. All right? Head, our heart, our hands. Now, you might be uh, in a place of your life where you're struggling. Maybe, maybe you're firing, uh, firing on all cylinders. But maybe you're like, you know what? I'm not, I'm not growing anymore. I'm caught in that drift. I'm kind of fading away, and I'm not sure that God wants to do a work in my life. Listen, he wants to do a work in your life. And here's how I know. Because of what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. We talked about this in the Philippians series last year. Um, God desires to do a work in your life. Here's what Paul writes. I am sure of this. In fact, some versions it says, I am confident. If you were to ask Paul, this would not be something that he waffles on. This would not be, you know, I think so. I'm pretty certain. No, he says, I am sure of this, that he who began a what? A good work. Now, it might be a long work. It might be a lifelong work. It might be a painful work. It might be a difficult work. But listen, it is a good work. I'm confident that he who began, he started a good work. What will he do? A good work in you. He will bring it about to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. What does that mean? It means that God's not through with you yet. He's not done. He is at work in your life. What does that mean? In our head, in our hearts, and in our hands. In our head. 
Um, he wants to challenge our mind. He wants to challenge our, our thinking. Um, Philippians, again, chapter 3, verse 10, Paul writes this, my goal, my goal is simple, to know him. Hey, Paul, what's, what's your goal? Is your goal to plant churches? That wasn't the goal. Did he plant churches? Yes. But his goal was to know him. Hey, Paul, is your goal to become a, a, a strong Christian, a strong believer? He was, but that wasn't his goal. His goal was to know him. And the, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed into the likeness of his, of his death. Paul says, look, my goal is to know him. I think Paul understood that what starts here shapes our future. Our mind becomes our, our thoughts become our words, right? Our words become actions. Our actions become character. And our character becomes our, our destiny. And so it is so important that we, that we make it our goal, like Paul, to know him. God also wants to shape our hearts. Jesus was asked the question, what's the greatest commandment? He summarizes it with these two. Love God with all of your heart. Like it starts right here. Listen, God's not just looking for the external actions and all the, all the stuff, right? He is looking and what he desires is our heart. We should love him with all of our heart. And likewise, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. So there's, there's this vertical love and then there's this horizontal love that is, that is expressed. But God is after our heart. He's also after our hands or our actions, our deeds, our works, our service. What did Jesus say? He said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Jesus Christ, the very son of God, was walking around on the earth and he wasn't thinking, what can others do for me? He was thinking, what can I do to serve others? And he served us in the most excellent way by going to the cross and dying for our sins. Listen, God wants to do a work in our head, in our hearts, in our hands. If God only wanted to address our minds, our head, then he would have sent a teacher. He would have sent a, a professor with all the letters, you know, after his name. If God only wanted to address our hearts, he would have sent a preacher and a powerful preacher, right? I'm going to stand behind a pulpit and just pound it, like really just kind of connect with the hearts of people. If God only wanted to address our hands and our actions and our deeds, then God would have sent a servant. But see, God wants to address and do a work, a transformational work, a life-changing work in our head, in our hearts, in our hands. So who did he send? He sent his son. He sent his son. In Matthew chapter 4, I want to read a verse that kind of summarizes um, where we're going in this uh, short series. Um, we're also going to be in Luke chapter 2 if you want to flip there after this. But in Matthew 4, this is the starting line, okay, of Jesus' ministry. Like things are just getting going. I think the, 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 the gun, you know, just went off. The race has just started. Jesus um, was baptized, um, so you have the, the dove descending on him, the, the spirit anointing him. You have the, the voice of God saying, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Jesus goes into the, uh, the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by, um, by the devil. He calls a few of the disciples, the fishing ones. They're already, they've been called uh, Peter, his brother Andrew, James, his brother John. They're starting to follow Jesus. And then Matthew gives us this verse, Matthew 4, verse 23, that summarizes the entirety of Jesus's ministry. Now, Jesus began to go all over Galilee, doing what? Teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. You see that? The ministry of Jesus is threefold. He came to teach. In other words, he wants to challenge people's minds. He came to preach. In other words, he wants to challenge and go after people's hearts. And he came to serve, to heal every sort of sickness and disease. This was his pattern. Now, as you look at the life of Christ, he had a wise ability, no matter who he was talking to, to know which one of these issues needed to be addressed. He knew. Um, for example, look at the, at the Pharisees. And the, and the head, the heart, and the hands really all go together, right? And it's when all of these are growing that we find ourselves uh, growing in our walks with the Lord. And Jesus addressed all of them. 
You see, if you take one of those legs out, the table falls over, right? It's like a two-legged stool. It doesn't hold up very well. So when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, what did he say? These were, these were people who had the knowledge and they had the heart, but they didn't have the hands. Right? They had the knowledge. They had all the knowledge about, about God's Word and the Old Testament and all the laws. They had the heart, the passion, the conviction. Man, if you, if you sinned, man, they pointed out. But they didn't have the hands to serve. So what did Jesus say? He said, you are blind guides. You're blind. You're, you're leading people, but you yourself are blind. In fact, he tells other disciples, hey, these guys are hypocrites. You can listen to what they say, but don't watch what they do. Like, don't, don't mimic your life after what they do because they do not practice what they preach. So when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, he was trying to address the hands. Um, I think about the story of the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, hey, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What did Jesus say? He said, do you know the law? He said, yeah, I know the law. In fact, I keep the law. I've done everything since I was a child. So the rich young ruler, right, he had the head knowledge. He had the hands, the willingness to do. Then what did Jesus say next? He said, all right, go sell all your possessions, give it to the poor, then come and follow me. What did the young man do? The Bible says he went away sad. Why was he sad? Because he was a man of great wealth. And it wasn't just his wealth that was the problem. It was that his heart was tethered to his wealth. And he wasn't willing to give Jesus his heart. And so he walked away. Uh, I love the story of Peter. I think we all can kind of identify with Peter. Peter had a passion, right? I mean, Peter had a heart for the Lord. Like He was willing to do anything. He had the hands. He was willing to, to take action. I mean, he's the one that stepped out of the boat, right? I mean, he's always acting, right? He's taking out a sword, cutting off people's ears, and all these different things. Um, there was a time when Jesus is telling the disciples, hey, my death is coming, but, but it's okay. Like, on the third day, I'm going to rise again, and this is, this is part of God's plan. And, and Peter, the Bible says he, he pulls Jesus off to the side, and he has a one-on-one -on -one with him. He's like, Jesus, like, stop talking about this. Like, man, I got your back. I got you. Like, we'll, we're, we're going to go to war, right? We're going we're gonna to establish the kingdom. We're going we're gonna to do this thing. They're not going to kill you. And what does Jesus say? He rebukes him and says, get behind me, Satan. Whew. Can you imagine, like, like Peter's, like, demeanor? Like, wait, wait, what'd you say? He says, get behind me, Satan. You're thinking about human concerns and not God's concerns. You see what's going on in Peter's life? He has the heart. The passion. He has the willingness to act, but he doesn't know the will of God. His, his mind is thinking about his own agenda, what he wants to see happen instead of what God wants to see happen. Listen, church, God wants to do a work in your head, in your heart, and in your hands. He wants to do a work in you. Now, I think we all would love for God to do a work through us, but we have to remember before God does a work through us, he first wants to do a work in us. Can I take you back to when Jesus called the first disciples, those fishermen guys, Peter and, and Andrew and James and John? What's he say? He says, follow me and I'll make you what? Fishers of men. You notice that Jesus didn't say, hey, follow me and I'll make you like a really good follower of me. I mean, you'll be the best follower of me. No one will follow me better than you. He doesn't say that. He says, follow me. In other words, I'll do a work in you. And as you follow me, I will make you, I will transform you into what? Into fishers of men. I'm going to do a work through you that you cannot even imagine or believe. And then we get to the latter part, Matthew 28. Jesus gives the great commission, right? The very mission of God to believers, to his followers, and he looks at the disciples and he says, look, all authority in heaven and on earth. That's important. Where does Jesus' authority come from? It comes from heaven. It's not, you know, he's not government approved, okay, and like, hey, you got to get the government sanction in order to do that. No, his, his authority comes, uh, it's in heaven, it's on earth. He says, all authority has been given to me. And I'm sure the disciples are like, yes, amazing. We're so glad. We're so thankful. And he says this, therefore, Go. Go and make disciples. 
baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Look at the Great Commission. Go, baptize, teach. Go, that's our hands, right? We have to act. Baptize, that's the, that's the heart issue, the transformation that begins right here. And teach. Teach what? Teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. And you notice like after the Great Commission in Matthew 28, the disciples didn't go. There's, like, there's, there's no response. They don't say, wait a second, you pulled a fast card on us, Jesus. We didn't know that that's what you were going to ask us to do. Can we just go back to following you? Like, no, they knew this was the mission of God. Because that's the mission he gave them at the very beginning. You follow me, and here's what I will do. I will make you fishers of men. The end goal is not just to be a good follower. The end goal is to make disciples. That's the goal. And it's as God is doing the work in me, my head, my heart, my hands, that then he'll begin to use me and through me reach other people to connect with their head, their hearts, and their hands. This is so important. Now, um, we're about halfway through. I want you to know that's kind of the introduction for the entire series. Okay, so we're going to spend the next hour jumping into the headpiece. Just kidding. Okay, don't. I think there was a real panic um, for that one. Okay. We're going to spend a few minutes talking about the head. What are, what's, what are the things we need to know? If God wants to challenge our thinking, if he wants to transform our mind, he wants to renew our minds, then what are the things we need to know? So I went through the scripture. There's about 782 things that we need to know. And I know we don't have time to work through those. But what if we started with one? What if there was one thing we all needed to know, and it was like, like a first domino? And all we have to do is know that first domino. And what does that domino do? It hits the next domino, the next domino, the next domino. And aren't you glad that God doesn't give it to us all at once anyway? I mean, that's not true in my life. That God doesn't just like download all the information we need to know about him. He knows we couldn't handle it. <laughs> but I'm thankful that he gives it to us when we need it um, at his proper time. So what, what would be one thing we need to know? If there was one thing that we all needed to know, I think it would be we need to know the will of God. And that's what Peter struggled with. He had the heart, he had the action, but he wasn't following necessarily God's will and God's plan. One of the questions that um, a lot of people ask is, what's my purpose? What's my purpose? Maybe you've asked that question. You're trying to identify um, that question. What is, what is my purpose? What does God want me to do? I want to try to spend a few minutes to answer that question. If you'll turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Love this story of Jesus. We're about to read the very first uh, recorded words of Jesus. All right, Not the first words, but the first recorded words. Uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 41 The scripture says this, every year his parents travel to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Now he would be Jesus, um, his parents would be Mary and Joseph. What would they do every year? They would travel to Jerusalem. This was customary. Think like Easter. Um, At Easter we kind of have our traditions, our celebrations. Uh, The Passover festival was this week-long celebration. People would migrate to Jerusalem. It was a big deal. And so Jesus' family has made their way. Verse 42, when he was 12 years old, They went up according to the custom of the festival. After those days were over, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Now, before you call CPS, okay, on Mary and Joseph, be patient with them. If we were to travel from one place to the next, we might take the minivan, okay? But in this time, when they're traveling from one city to the next, they took the caravan, all right? Just a big group of people would, would herd up and walk together. There was safety in numbers, right? You wouldn't get robbed or have to worry about thieves and, um, and things like that. And usually the guys would kind of hang out and gravitate together, and the ladies would hang out and gravitate together, and the kids would hang out and gravitate together. And so they leave leave Jerusalem, and Mary and Joseph just assume that Jesus is in the crowd. Like if today, if we said, hey, we're going to take the entire church, um, we're going to walk to Gerald, all right, everybody just, you know, head out on the highway, and hey, don't worry, the kids, they're going to tag along, they're going to be there, and you might, as a parent, uh, you just might, you might go. Actually, we probably wouldn't do that today. We would, you know, be holding tightly onto our our kids' hands. So um, they're on the way. Assuming he was in the traveling party, they went a day's journey. All right, so an entire day has passed. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. Um, Jesus, where are you? Right? Mary's like, can't find him. Her and Joseph meet up. I thought he was with you. No, I thought he 
um, was with you. Mary starts to get a little bit concerned, remembering back to what the angel told her, and she's thinking, man, I had one job to do, right? Like, take care of the Messiah, and I have lost him. <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> this is very bad. Um, when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. So they're, so they're a day's journey away from Jerusalem. They have a day's journey back to Jerusalem. They spend an entire day looking for Jesus. Verse 46, after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. That's huge. 12-year-old Jesus in the temple, having conversations, question and answer sessions with the religious elite. This was a big deal. Imagine like a 12-year-old boy, all right, at Texas Rangers in the locker room, hanging out with the coaches and the players, going over the strategy for the game. Imagine a, a young girl sitting with Mozart and Beethoven, discussing the incredible, inc- intricacies <laughs> of a symphony. Like he's, he's in the big leagues. And all those who heard him were astounded. Wow. This young man is, is different. They were astounded at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. <laughs> they were astounded as well, but for different reasons. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Like we've been so nervous. We have been worried, sick. And you get the sense that Mary is both mad and relieved. Like she's relieved that she has now found the son of God. But she's also mad. Like, why did did you run off? What were you doing? Like you had us worried, sick. And notice Jesus' response. Again, these are the first words recorded. Why were you searching for me? Why? Why Why were you searching? Why were you upset? Why were you anxiously looking? It's almost like it doesn't compete with him. We we understand that Jesus is now becoming aware of his mission, his purpose. Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? Why were you looking for me? Didn't you know this is where I'd be? It's almost like Jesus is is having to remind his own parents of his calling, his purpose, and his mission. Some of your versions um, might use the phrase, didn't you know that I would be about my father's business? Now, I read that version. I read the version, didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? And I'm like, well, which is it, house or business? Let's go to the Greek and find out. Let's study this bad boy. You pull up the Greek, and you know what's interesting? The word for house or the word for business is not in there. It's implied through the text, through the meaning, but the word is not there. It's simply the word, my father. And Greek reads kind of reverse from English, and so if you translate the Greek directly over, it would sound like this. Didn't you know my father must be I? Didn't you know my father must be I? It sounds kind of like Yoda in Star Wars. Okay, kind of saying it backwards, but didn't you know my father must be I? The word be, exist. Didn't you know that I should be in my father's presence? Didn't you know that I would be about my father's plan and my father's purpose? You know what you will never find Jesus asking? Jesus never asks the question, what's my purpose? You know why? It's kind of a selfish question, isn't it? It's me-centered. What is my purpose? It's kind of funny. We're going to see in a video later on. Um, you'll, we'll come back to that. What's my, what's my purpose? But Jesus never asked the question because I think it's a selfish question because Jesus was never concerned. What's my purpose? You know what his concern was? What's God's purpose? What's God's mission? What's God's business? <laughs> Must be I. My father must be. I want to be about his business. I'm not here for me. I'm here for him. That makes all the difference. 
So here's what we need to know, right? We're challenging our minds. We're, we're getting that first domino. We've got to understand what our purpose is. It's to know him. It's to be about our father's business. Now, you might be here like, okay, Andy, I'm in. <laughs> my heart's there. My head's there. My hands are there. I want to be about my father's business, but it's, it's, it seems kind of mysterious, like a fog. Like, how do I know what my father's business is? How do I know what he wants me to do? It's actually quite simple. Let me kind of take the fog away, remove the mystery, and let's simplify it. Listen, when you know the father, you know the father's desires. We, we want to aim for the desires. We want to aim for the plan. We want to aim for, for the stuff. And look, I'm guilty of that as well. God, here's my plan. Would you bless it? God, here's my agenda. I'm going to be spiritual, and I'm going to surrender it to you, and I'm going to ask you to provide and work my plan. When instead, we should be seeking his plan, his agenda, his business. Listen, when you know the Father, you know the Father's business. You know the Father's desires. When, when our family goes and um, grabs a burger, because I know the Comer Cuties and because I know my wife, I know what to order. Because I know them, I know their desires. Take me to any burger joint. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to get a hamburger with cheese only. And they're always going to ask, you want mayonnaise or mustard? Nope, cheese only, plain and dry. I want a second burger with pickles only. Don't put anything else on it. No mayonnaise, no mayonnaise, just pickles only. Third burger, we want some light mayonnaise, okay? Some lettuce, tomatoes, and pickles. The, third, uh, the fourth burger, just whatever your specialty is. Make it just like that. That's, that's how my wife wants it. You, you put mustard on it, leave mustard on it. You put ketchup and mayo, then put ketchup and mayo. That's how, that's how she likes it. Listen, when you know someone, you know what they desire. Listen, it's a sign of intimacy, to know what someone desires. Can you imagine if your best friend lost their parent? Let's just kind of use that illustration. If you're their best friend, you wouldn't call and say, what can I do? You'd be right over and start meeting needs in their life. Why? Because you know them. You know what they need. You know their desires. It's those who ask, hey, is there anything that I can do for you? It's a sign the relationship is different, not, a, not a distant. It's not a bad question. It's just a sign of the relationship. Listen, we should know God. We should know the Father. We should know Christ. We should live in His Spirit and be in tune and know what He desires because we first and foremost know Him. And when you know Him, you know the Father's desires. There's a, a story that Jesus tells about a, a, a master that tells a servant to go fix dinner. And then he, he tells him, he's like, you don't thank the servant because he fixed dinner. You don't thank the servant because of his obedience. No, he was just doing what he was told. Listen, we, he says in, in the same way, if you do what you're told, what profit is it? You're an unprofitable servant. And it also reminds me, and I'll close with this, this story. The, um, Jesus tells a parable of a master giving talents to his servants. To one he gives five, to one he gives two, to another he gives one. You might think, well, that seems unfair. That's um, inequality, right? He's, he's messed this thing up. But the master knows the servants. He knows what their ability is. So to one he gives five, to one he gives two, to another he gives one. What does the one with five do? It says that he goes and he puts it to work and he gets five more. The one who has two, he goes and he puts it to work and he gets two more. What's the one with one do? Well, um, he goes and takes a shovel and uh, digs a hole and buries it. When the master comes back and they have to give an account, they're held responsible for what they did with what the master gave him. The one with five says, hey, I made five more. And the master says, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. To the one who gained two, he gets the exact same response. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. The one who had one says, hey, I, I went and hit it. I didn't know what you were going to do. I was afraid. So I didn't do anything. What's the master say? He says, you wicked and lazy servant. Can I be honest? There's something about that that, that has bothered me a little bit. And what has bothered me is the master never told the servants what to do. 
All he did was entrust these possessions to them with no instructions, and yet he holds them accountable. Listen, the one who had five and the one who had two, they knew exactly what to do because they knew the master. And when they knew the master, they knew the master's desires. The one who had one, I don't think he really knew the master. I think he was afraid of the master. And he says that. I was afraid you were a harsh man. And he didn't know what the master desired. Listen, I long for the day to hear from my heavenly father, well done. Well done. You see, knowing God's purpose for your life is not this fog or this mystery. It's, it's simply knowing Him. And as we know Him and as we walk with Him, we know His desires. We know His ways and we know His Word. And we live in that and we operate in that. And there's a boldness and a confidence that comes from knowing God and knowing His desires. So the question I want to leave you with is this. Do you know him? Do you know him? Do you truly know him? Not, not mental assent. You know, the devil knows God. The Bible says he shudders, trembles. Do you know him? I'm going to invite you to bow your heads and, and close your eyes. What's the Holy Spirit saying to you today? Where is he challenging you? Is it an area of the head, the mind, your, your thoughts? Hey, what, what evidence would be enough? Listen, last night we heard testimonies from people about the faithfulness of God, the goodness with God. Listen, there's a, there's a lot of things you can argue with. You can't argue with someone's story. <laughs> you can't argue with light in the darkness. Listen, God wants to do a work in you, first and foremost. But he also wants to do a work through you. And I believe the two go hand in hand. But it starts with that place of surrender. Coming to the point saying, God, I, I want to know you. I want to know you. I want to know Christ. The power of his resurrection. The fellowship of his suffering. Being conformed even unto his death. God, we have to die to ourselves. We have to die to our agenda, to our will, to our business. And God, we want to be a people. We want to be a church. We want to be a, a family of God that says we are about our Father's business. So the world doesn't have to look for us. But God, they would know. God, we're about your business of making disciples. And then in knowing you, we would know your desires. So I ask again, do you know him? In a second, I'm going to pause. I'm going to say amen. I'm going to walk off uh, to my right, to your left, behind these curtains. There's some other people on our prayer team. Listen, we'd love to spend some time with you and, and pray with you and encourage you and bless you. As soon as I say amen, if there's a, a need that you have, there's a question that you have, you want to know God, you want to know how to, how to be saved, how to be baptized, and we would love to help you um, take that next step. Listen, what is the Holy Spirit asking of you? Lord, move in this place. We give you our all. Challenge our thoughts. God, renew our minds for your honor, for your glory. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Let's stand together.